Hello, I'm Jay Jermaine Bay, Kazi, which means judge of Elodium Morris Pradium. I am the judge for Consular Court, and today I would like to go over a little bit more information as it relates to part three of the question is, how did the Moors lose their land? So today is part three and a continuation of that. So remember, as we went over in parts one, we talked about its cheat hypothecation. That's how the Moors lost their land. Parts two, we start getting the definition of color, etc., because the hybrid Europeans who go under the nom de guerre name of American, American or white people, which they're really colonists, they're settlers, these people are really chiefly British. That's their real nationality, British. So therefore, what you must understand is that who are we talking about? We're talking about a feud, feud, a feud of the colonists versus the Moors. So in the definition of feudal, it's a compound word for few and owl. The word owl means the owls. Who are the owls? The Moors. Then we looked up the definition. We looked up the definition of a lodial. A lodial means not having a superior over you. But a lodial starts with A-L, owl. So the opposite, the antonym of feudal is a lodial. The antonym of a lodial is feudal. So therefore, the colonists are feuding with the owls. Now who are the owls? The Moors. All right? So we'll keep talking about how did the Moors lose their land? They lost their land through a steep and hypothecation. Go back to video one and you'll see that. All right? So today we'll continue on to understand how the Moors lose their land, and more importantly, what's the remedy on how do they get the land back? We'll talk about that as well. There's no use in talking about problems unless you have solutions. Problem, solution. And what's the main solution? The mothers. The mothers must use a pen to get themselves back into common law. We'll talk about that today. All right? So first things first. Now that we understand hypothecation and its cheat, we must understand the other words that delude to slavery. How to get the more to take on brands that subjugated them, and how the colonists give themselves de facto titles that gave them a false superior status that does not, that's not acceptable by Rotarian terms around the world as it relates to nationality, because white is not a nationality. Yet white is a superior position anytime you're talking about crayons. And what are the five families of the crayons? You got white, Red, yellow, brown, and black. So therefore, white. What's the opposite of white? Black, from the furthest extreme. You'll find that in the definition of black. It talks about the extreme gray scale, the gray scale, talking about the extremes. The extreme is black, white, or when you reverse it, black on top, white on top. So therefore, this is a status game that's being played where they're claiming to be white, but ain't no such thing as white people on planet Earth. If you go to Europe right now, there's 50 countries in Europe. None of them are named white. You go to Africa right now, there's 54 countries in Africa. None of them are named black. So where did these white and black people come from? Because the people, listen, the people are named after the land, and the land is named after the people. So if there's no white land, then how could people be named white? It's a caste system. That must be known, but it's not real in law, but it's real in legality. So in the legality, that's what you call de facto, de facto government and rule, called statutes and codes. In common law, it's a violation of what they do under a legal status, because in common law, that's for people, and people have nationality. So therefore, under common law, which is the mothers, the mothers create nationality. Under legal, in which the color is created, everybody's a crayon, an adjective. 
civil leader more too. So today we'll keep talking about what else did the colonists do to steal the land from the Moors? First thing you must understand is that they always use what's called a pen. They used a pen to write the Moors out of history. Then they used a pen to write themselves into a de facto status pretending to be Moors. The power of the pen is mightier than the sword. So the Moors must use a pen to write themselves back into their rightful position as being the primogenitor, Moors. And we'll talk about that today. So first thing we must do is understanding law and history. So therefore, under what's called the Naturalization Act of 1870, is when the colonists, by the stroke of a pen through their Congress, their de facto government, which is their House of Representatives, congressmen, their senators, judicial branch, and the executive branch being the president, the two branches at the bottom, the legislators, legislators in the House of Representatives, House of Representatives, legislators, senators, judicial, they put together a bill called the Naturalization Act, sent that to the president of the United States, who signed it into law. And what happened is they exceeded and stole the birthright from the Moors. How did they do it? With a pen. What specifically did they write? Let's take a look at it. So what we're going to do is we're going to have the mothers read the Naturalization Act of 1870. Why is that important? Because mothers are always responsible for the law, the legislation of law. So therefore, we're going to have the mothers read it because we have to bring the mothers back into the fold of government. So, Mother, would you like to read the Naturalization Act of 1870? What page is that? It is page 256. Okay, so please speak up for the people 256, at home. page 256. So, is it 254 through 256? Correct. All right, so pages 254 through 256. Section 7. Section 7, all right. And it reads as follows. And be it further enacted that the naturalization law are hereby extended to aliens of African nativity and to persons of African descent. All right, thank you, Mother. So what happened there? The colonists, through a pen, or what they call legislation, through their hand, said that the descendants of Africans shall be citizens of the United States. That's what you call fraud. Why is it fraud? Because under the definition of ex parte, which means a one-sided, unilateral decision, the United States of America, not to be confused, the United States, both being corporations, the United States of America decided to bring the Moors in as citizens. They couldn't do that. They did not get consent from the Moors. More specifically, the Moorish women. But yet, they corrupted the bloodline of the Moors by saying they, they shall now be citizens of the United States through the stroke of a pen without getting consent from the other party of the contract. What contract are we talking about? The Treaty of Peace and Friendship, 1786, signed in the courts of Morocco and then fully ratified by the United States of America in 1787. Which means, under Article 20, if there's any dispute between a citizen of the United States or a more, then the consul shall make the final decision. So if the United States had a dispute with Moors, they couldn't arbitrarily make a, uni a unilateral decision under ex parte to make Moors citizens of the United States. They couldn't do it because we're two separate nations. They put Moors under the guise of being citizens, citizens of the United States. They couldn't do that. That's called fraud. So therefore, you go back to the Vienna Convention of 1969, reference point. You look up Article 48 that says there was an error. Well, what was the error? Now you got to look up Article 49. It says there was fraud. Well, who committed the fraud? You look at Article 50, it says corruption by a state representative. So the representatives, the legislators of the United States, your governors, etc., through a stroke of a pen, said that Moors 
shall be sensed in the United States. That's fraud. That's corruption. But then you look at Article 51 of the Vienna Convention, 1969, it says, coercion by a state. What state? The United States of America. All fraud. Which makes it void ab initio. Void ab initio means void from the beginning. So anything they did with that pen that they didn't get consent from Moors, immediately in law, it is null and void. Void ab initio, Latin word for meaning void from the beginning. All right, so as we learn with the reference point of the Naturalization Act of 1870, specifically, page 254, 256, section 7. Okay, Mother, go ahead and read um, the uh, Naturalization Act of 1870, pages 254 to 256, section 7, please. And be it further enacted that the naturalization laws are hereby extended to aliens of African nativity and to persons of African descent. All right, so they're saying that the descendants of Africans are aliens. Well, wait a minute. Well, how could that be? So what are they using that? What word are they using to identify a person as being an alien? The word is called denizen. Denizen. D-E-N-I-V-E-N. -E -E which means you're an alien or a subject. So today we're talking about the definition of denizen so you can see how the Moors lost their land through a stroke of a pen by the act of Congress, the de facto legislators who fraudulently put the Moors as citizens underneath the United States of America. So for the purpose of the viewers at home, we're going to go to uh, Denison. That's on page 522 of the Black's Law Dictionary, 4th edition. And we're going to have the mothers read, starting with the word denization, denization, Fourth edition. When the mothers read, now we're starting to help with fallen humanity because when the mothers study and comprehend, then the mothers are the first teacher of the child. We can start to bring the children back in the proper fold of government. So let's go ahead and read denization, one of the mothers. The act of making one a denizen, the conferring of the privileges of citizenship upon an alien born. An act. So first thing you must understand, it's an act. What's an act? It's an action. An act by who? Legislators with the pen. Why is this important to understand? Because there's these people who call themselves the Americans, white people, colonists, settlers, who are really chiefly British, don't have sovereignty in this land because they're not the primogenitor, aboriginals, autochthonous, um, natives of this land. So therefore, they got to use a pen illegally to give themselves rights over moors. So what's happening? There's an act of making one a denizen. So they made someone a denizen. And we're going to find out what's the true definition of a denizen. The conferring of the privileges of citizenship upon an alien born. So they gave you privileges in exchange for rights. So what happened? They took your right of nationality they took your right of your birthright and in exchange gave you privileges. Privileges is way different than rights. Just like your child, you can buy them a cell phone and let them use it. They have a privilege of using it, but they don't have a right because they didn't buy it and they don't pay for the cell phone bill, which means you can take it from that child anytime you want because he's got the privilege of using it. However, you have the right because you own it. So they gave us privileges under the status of alien and took away our rights. But that was under the context of fraud, ex parte, a unilateral decision of corruption. Let's continue. So the next, the next word is denizize. We're on page 522. Denizize, if we have the mothers read it. Denies. Denies. Excuse me. To make a man a denizen or a citizen. Okay, so deny is not a really simplifying it now, right? They made a man a denizen or citizen. How did they make something? With a pen. 
They created something. Because you are already born a more. So they have to now, as a man, they have to tell you now you are a black man. You're no longer a more. They made you a denizen. You're a black man. You're an Afri African man. You are a what they call African American. They give you all these titles. Negro, mulatto, Indian. Everything but more. Everything but Moroccan. Because those words are nation national names. The other ones are denizen brands. Let's continue with the definition of denizen. In English law, a person who, being an alien born, has obtained ex donation regis, letters patent to make him an English subject. A high... Let's, let's stop right there. Before we go any further, let's get a basic understanding. That's what Morris must do. Comprehend. Got to go back and comprehend what they just read. Under denizen, in English law, a person who being an alien born, how could you be an alien born? First things first, we're talking English law, Great Britain. So a lot of people don't know that the United States of America Corporation is governed by the laws of Great Britain. All attorneys must pass what's called a bar association. What does the bar stand for? It's an acronym for British Accredited Registry. That Great Britain has what they call the Commonwealth Jurisdiction over Morocco on behalf of their United States of America citizens. Because all United States citizens are really under British, British, British protections. So therefore, that's why I tell you immediately English law. Well, I thought this was the United States of America. Why are you talking about English law? Because the British Parliament controls the United States of America. Why? Because the British are here as the legislators in the United States of America Congress. What was your question, Mother? Can you repeat the acronym for uh, BAR? So BAR stands for British Accredited Registry. That's why all your attorneys, your lawyers, which are your barristers, and your turners. What do they call them? Turners. Because they turn you over to the jurisdiction of the crown. They're all officers of the de facto court. They're all colluding together to steal the birthright of the Moors. On behalf of the crown, i.e. England. Let's continue. Continue with the reading. Um, so that, that's on me. Let me continue the breakdown. So we got in English law, a person who's being an alien born. So first things first, how can you be an alien born? Everybody's born with a nationality. So what are they saying that you're an alien born? You must understand there's four classifications. Watch this. There's four classifications. The first classification is national. That's a nationality. The second classification is citizen. The third classification is subject, and then the fourth classification is alien. So these people call themselves Negro, Black, and Colored, African American, and sometimes Baptist. They're listed as aliens, which is the lowest class of status. What's higher than an alien? Subject. What is a subject? Someone is a servant. What is a citizen? Well, in Rome, they tell you the citizens have the power. Those of your rich elite, they have citizens. What's a citizen? Someone who has a nationality and can enforce the policies of rights. Where it is, people that are subjects and citizens can only enforce civil rights, which are, which are less than rights. Civil rights mean that you can only enforce a portion a percentage of rights. Where it is citizens and nationals can enforce all political rights under a constitution and treaties. So that's classification, you must understand, two different classifications. So watch this. How can the United States claim to be a nation 
We're not, not claiming a nationality. If you ask anyone that claims to be a United States citizen, then what's the nationality of the people? Watch this. Mexicans come from Mexico. Brazilians come from Brazil. Italians come from Italy. The British come from Great Britain. Now, let's go back to the United States. What's your nationality of the United States? The people are named after the land, the land named after the people, so what's your nationality? United States. United States of America is your nationality. Don't make no damn sense. So you ask somebody who calls themselves United States says, hey, what's your nationality? They're supposed to respond with United States of America. That's the nationality. Look on any passport, and it tells you right there, nationality, United States of America. Don't make no sense. You don't even see the game being played. So you said everybody in the United States of America, nationality is the United States of America? That's BS. Because the United States of America is a corporation, not a nationality, because a nationality must have consanguinity blood steps to it. So therefore, the reality is everybody in the United States of America that calls themselves a citizen is really a subject. Subject to who? Great Britain. Because Great Britain can claim the consanguinity as being British, and everybody else calls them a subject status. It's an alien status. Alien means you don't even come from a land. Because a subject, at the very least, can claim, well, I'm a national, it's just that I'm a slave. But I still have a nationality. An alien doesn't have a nationality. That's why they call an alien, saying, you just dropped out of the sky, just fell down, because alien means you don't come from any land mass, no country. You can't even name the pedigree. So you got people calling around calling themselves Negro, Black, and Color. That's not a nationality, which means you're an alien because you're not telling nobody what motherland you came from. Mm -hmm. That's why they're classifying people who call themselves Negro, Black, and Color, Indian, Baptist, etc., alien. Because you ain't telling nobody where you came from. At the very least, a subject can claim a nationality, but they're a slave. They're the ones at the bottom of the totem pole. Citizens can claim nationality. Nationals is the nationality. So why are they talking about we're aliens? Remember, Naturalization Act, 1870, said the descendants of Africans shall be aliens. What did they do? They attacked the mothers. They removed the mother out of the scene and said the child now don't have a mother, which means you don't come from no land because all mothers come from a land. Once you remove the mother out the, out the equation, you can claim that child as being an alien says they don't have a mother. That's why they call Mother Earth, Mother Land. Black people don't have a land. Why? Because there ain't no such thing as black people. There's 35 countries in the continent of America. None of them are named brown or black. There's 45 countries in Asia. None of them are called yellow. So if you have somebody from China come and call themselves yellow, Immediately, they're an alien because there ain't no such thing as yellow people and no yellow country or state. So how can people be black if there's no black country? You're an alien. You don't have a mother to claim you as one of theirs. So what happens? You get adopted by the state of wherever you think you came from. And that state of, in all caps, is claiming you as an adoption agency, as an alien. They took you in, said, oh, where's your mother? You don't know where your mother is? Well, what's your nationality? Oh, you said you're black? Oh, yeah. We're going to go ahead and adopt you and put you under our rules and regulations as an alien. Matter of fact, we don't even give you our last name. Smith, Jones, and Johnson, and remove your bae, Al, El, Ali, Il, etc. Under alien status, you get adopted by the state of Colorado Corporation, as an example. Let's continue with the reading. Um, where am I? Oh, a high and incommunicable branch of the royal prerogative. A denizen is in a kind of middle state between an alien and a natural born subject and partakes of the status of both of these. So wait a minute. So a denizen is stuck between an alien and a subject. 
an alien and a subject. So a person calls himself Negro, black, and colored is an alien, but they can also be considered a subject. Why? Because they're the slaves subjected to subjected to what? They have to pledge allegiance to their adopted mother and father and start doing work in the fields on behalf of their adopted mother and father. So they're the stepchild. So they get some privileges. They get some privileges, but no rights. Let's continue with the reading. The term denizen is used to signify a person who, being an alien by birth, has obtained letters patent letters patent making him an English subject. Stop. So what are they talking about right there? What's the letter? What's the patent letter? You know what they're saying? That's the birth certificate. And the marriage certificate. As soon as the mother, African mother, gives birth to the child, the state of and its hospital, and the hospital is part of the conspiracy, they take the child into the birth war. Because the child is born immediately as an alien because they don't have nationality. Then the state says immediately it's a stateless person, meaning they don't have no state to claim, and they can't claim it's coming from the state of Mexico. All of, my, all, of sudden, all of a sudden, you become an alien and make you a ward of the state. They take in a birth ward and then a warden of a prison, warden of a prison, oversees these people who are incarcerated. So, therefore, aliens, subjects are incarcerated, being adopted children of the United States of America, not to confu be confused, the United States or the several states. They bring you in as an adopted child that has no nationality. So therefore, when they talk about the patent letter, they're talking about the birth certificate the, because the birth certificate is the mother registering her child over to the state of and saying, that's now your child. Because they put the child's name in all capital letters on the birth certificate. And the mother don't realize she just signed a contract with the state of Colorado to say, yes, my child for the record is an alien, and now you've adopted it, and I did an adoption agent. That's all it is. But they didn't tell you they were adopting your child. Taking it as property, an adoption agency. And you didn't say objection, because you didn't recognize that the names are all cap making the corporation, and they didn't tell you about the adhesion contract. What's an adhesion contract? See, when they gave you the birth certificate, that was one little piece of paper, and you signed off on it. But you didn't know that one piece of paper had a big, thick contract assessed to it. That's called an adhesion contract. So in law, you must let both parties know what are the terms and conditions of said contract. And failure to do so makes that contract void. It's ex parte. It's fraud. Because they will explain to you as a mother that their birth certificate or marriage certificate is a bond to take your child away and all your privileges as a mother to make it an alien, you would have never agreed to that. So the letter of patent is the birth certificate and marriage certificate. It's the bond. Bondage. Your child was born into bondage. That's what they call sin. Ignorance. Ignorance of what? Ignorance of the law. Because ignorance of the law is no excuse. Let's continue with the reading. Okay. The king may deny, but not naturalize a man. The latter requiring the content of parliament as under the Naturalization Act. 1870, Section 33. So you don't need to read the case law. But let's point out what they just said. See, they just pointed out the fraud, didn't they? The Naturalization Act of 1870. Isn't that what we read earlier? Page 254 to 256, Section 7. They're pointing out how did they make you a denizen through the Naturalization Act of 1870. Descendants of Africans shall be citizens of the United States and be considered aliens. Aliens don't have a nationality. 
Okay, let's skip over the case law and go straight into the linear entry after that. That wasn't case law. Okay. That was section. The next sentence is a denizen holds a position midway between an alien and a natural born or naturalized subject, being able to take lands by purchase or devise, which an alien could not until 1870 do, but not able to take lands by descent which a natural-born or naturalized subject may do. Okay. So what's happening here? The colonists knew they couldn't own land as a colonist. So they had to say that the Moors were dead on paper through a, a pen call it cheap and hypothecation and said they were dead on paper. They're aliens now. They don't have a mother. They disappeared. They capsized. They perished. And now the colonists come in and they say under the Naturalization Act of 1870, now they wield the power of the pen to buy property. Let's continue to read it. It'll make sense to you in just a second. The denizen becomes a British subject from the date of the letters, while a naturalized person is placed in a position equivalent to that of a natural-born subject. Okay, let's stop right there. It says the denizen became a British subject. Remember I told you earlier that all United States of America citizens are really British subjects. They tell you right then and there. Let's continue with that. And it says from the date of the letters, what letters? Birth certificates. Birth certificates. Naturalized person because of the 1870 Naturalization Act. As a plan in um, position equivalent to that of a natural born subject. Now let's look at natural born. You see the word natural born? Mm -hmm. The average person will read that and zip right past it. But you see a little hyphen in the middle? That hyphen in the middle means a compound adjective, meaning natural born should be two separate words. That's for people with blood. As soon as they put the words together with a hyphen, it merely means that's a compound adjective, which means what? People are nouns. A compound adjective means adjective is not a noun. It can't be a person, place, or thing. So you're naturally born as an alien because an alien doesn't have consanguinity, doesn't have bloodline in it because it doesn't have a mother. So the definition of natural born under a legal pen, they said on paper, you're dead, you're an adjective. You're not a noun anymore. You're an adjective. With an adjective the, can't be a person, place, or thing. With the dash in between. With the dash, the hyphen, the dash in between means compound adjective. So it's a game they're playing, but most people don't catch that. People go around here saying, man, yeah, my baby was naturally born. I had natural birth, natural birth. They don't know in their language they're saying natural born with a hyphen. Because that's what the colonists put in their documentation on the policy that everybody's natural born with a hyphen. No one's born as natural born two words. Only on the common law are you born with the two words. Let's continue to read. Okay. Um, the denizen becomes a British subject, subject from, oh, we read that already. Mm -hmm. The word is also used in this sense in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Continue. In, case study. in American law, a dweller, a stranger admitted to certain rights in a foreign country or as one who lives habitually in a country but is not a native-born citizen, one holding a middle state between an alien and a natural-born subject. Continue. One who has some relation to the enemy nation which is not lost by the alien's presence within the United States. Continue. Thus, one who lived and worked in Austria in 1938 at, time, at the time Germany obtained control of Austrian government and continued to live there until leaving for the United States in 1939 at which time he was issued a German passport, was a denizen of Germany within any in, enemy 
alien within the enemy alien act. Okay, stop. So that last paragraph you just read, watch this. Let's read it again for comprehension. Thus, one who lived and worked in Austria in 1938, I believe that's 38, at time of Germany, obtained control of Austrian government and con con continued to live there until leaving for the United States in, I think that's 1889? 1939. Print small. At which time he was issued a German passport, was a denizen of Germany within the Enemy Alien Act. What does that mean? Watch this. Let me give you an example of what happened. Austria is a country. Germany is a country. Germany came in and annexed, took over the land, invaded Austria, and overshadowed them with a shadow government called a de facto government. So the Germans told the Australian Austrians they should now call themselves Germans. Not Austrians, but Germans. So here it is, these people, Austrians have Austrian nationality, but the German government is telling them, you better call yourself German because this is all Germany now. So what happened is this. When the Austrians wanted to now fly out of Germany, they had to get a German passport to come to the United States. But yet they ain't German. So therefore, in the definition of denizen, they are subjects of Germany. But Germany, through the use of force, hypothecation in its cheat, through a marriage certificate, birth certificate, forced these Austrians to call themselves German. That's the same thing happened to the Moors. The United States comes in, you got Moors in Morocco, two separate nations. Go back and read George Washington's letter to Sidi Muhammad. He talked about two separate nations. Now all of a sudden, the United States, through use of force, forces the Moors to come in under the United States of America and a denizen status alien through the Naturalization Act of 1870. Section 7 on page 254 to 256. And classified them as denizens. So now these people who call themselves Negro, Black, and Color, if they fly out of the United States of America, they got to get what type of passport? United States of America passport. Dennis, subjects. They've been working overtime on these pins. Mm -hmm. so to the power of the people. <laughs> Let's continue. So that's an example. You see, they're giving you examples of what a denizen is? Someone who's been subjugated. Let's continue with the reading. Um, a denizen, in the primary but obsolete sense of the word, is a natural-born subject of a country. So therefore, a denizen is a natural-born subject of a country. You're subject. Subject to what? You're subject to all the rules, regulations, in order for you to have privileges, but you don't have rights. So now let's go look up the definition of subject. Because you don't have sanguinity. Correct. You, you're not a family member by blood of the adopted family. Mm -hmm. You're the redhead stepchild that turns around. Your adopted family turns around and molests you. They discriminate against you because you're different, but yet they're obligated to take care of you because they're your adopted parents. But they only keep you around for one reason and one reason only because they're living off your vast estate. What they didn't tell you is that you're rich and they're living off your estate because you're a trust fund baby and you didn't even know it. So your adopted family is acting like, acting like powers of attorney and living good off of your vast estate and giving you crumbs and a mop and a bucket and a broom telling you clean the house of the mansion that your ancient mother and fathers bestowed onto you but the colonists moved in and made you the janitor because you bumped your head under psychosis and cognitive dissonance. And since now you act like a lunatic, they get to bring you in, 
treat you like an adopted child. What's the definition of a lunatic? Lunar. Lunar tick. Meaning going around in a circle. Lunar, like the moon, lunar. It means you go from two different personalities. One personality, you act like you're highly intelligent. Then all of a sudden you tell somebody you're black. They say, well, wait, hold up. <laughs> That's the definition of a lunatic. Someone that shows signs of intelligence, then they space out, and they do something stupid, say something stupid, act stupid, that denationalizes them. So you got the homeless out here in the street. You talk to a homeless person for about two or three minutes, they act like they got some sense. Man, how'd you end up out here on the street? Then all of a sudden they space out. Start talking and mumbling and doing their thing. Say, oh, I see now your ass crazy. <laughs> but the reality is they ain't, they ain't crazy. They're a lunatic. They go from signs of intelligence and then they show some levels of being a moron. And that's the definition of black people, Negroes, African Americans. And those people call themselves Baptists. It's the truth. All right, here we go. So now we're going to look at the definition of alien. So we can have the mothers read alien. Let's start from the top. Alien. Now, a foreigner, one born abroad. A person who owes allegiance to a foreign government. In this country is a person born out of the United States and unnaturalized under our, our constitution and laws. Stop. So, what we're already understanding is that an alien is a foreigner and one born abroad. So therefore, what they're saying is an alien, which is Negro, Blacks, and Coloreds, were born abroad and not on their own land. You were born in somebody else's jurisdiction. So let's really talk about, let's get down to it, why I say they're talking about the mothers. I now want you to go down to the last paragraph on the definition of alien and read that, the small print. As to the effect of marriage, on the status of women, whether they were originally aliens or citizens of the United States. And you got your case law. And the case law. So let's read that sentence one more time aloud. I'm going to read it. As to the effect of marriage on the status of women, whether they were originally aliens or citizens of the United States. Right then and there, they're telling you what they're doing to the women. Right then and there, they're telling you they're attacking the woman. They're saying the woman don't have a nationality. So therefore, my beautiful sisters out there call themselves black, Negro, colored, minority, African American. None of those things are nationalities. You're immediately cast under status of alien. So therefore, when you have a child, the child is born with the same status as the mother. So if the mother's an alien, the child's immediately an alien under the birth certificate. So why are they talking about the marriage certificate here? Oh, because the marriage certificate and the birth certificate are the same type of certificate. What does it mean? So when a sister that calls herself black get married with her husband, the marriage certificate means this, that the state of Colorado, so when you stand there and you say, I do, the priest, the pastor, the rabbi, etc., they get that one loose leaf piece of paper, that one piece of paper that's really a contract, but they only give you the signature page. And they say, by the powers invested in me by the state and God, I pronounce you husband and wife. And you go off and sign a certificate, and what did you just do? You just signed the rights of your fallopian tubes, your eggs, the mother, just signed the rights of the unborn child over to the state of Colorado Corporation, all caps, as an example. So the marriage certificate is another bond on the unborn child. That the child, as soon as it's born, is born as an alien because you just agreed that the status of the mother is going to be the status of the child, and they just made you sign another contract under marriage to say, to affirm, when you have a child, immediately bring them to the hospital, sign that birth certificate, because that child belongs to us. You can't leave with that child, with the marriage certificate, because that child's born on so-called United States soil. 
So therefore, they catch the child in advance while it's still an egg in the fallopian tubes through the marriage certificate. It's automatically an orphan before it's born. So between a birth certificate and a marriage certificate, they're both bondage for your child. So you must understand when you look at that revelations in the Bible, I believe it's chapter 12, verse 1 through 6. It talks about there's a woman cries out because she's giving birth to a child and appears a red dragon that stands in front of her. And the dragon standing there waiting to devour the child. The woman gives birth to a male, a son. And then the son is taken up into heaven and saved. What does all that mean? If the dragon is so bad, why didn't the dragon eat both the child and the mother? Why didn't he just eat the mother before she gave birth to the child? If he's so bad, the dragon now, red dragon, is because the dragon knows that you are God. You're the true entity. You create life. He can't touch you. So what does he do? He attacks the child. That's the Naturalization Act of 1870. The colonists took your child and made your child an alien. Because he knows he can't get you, so he gets the child every time. The offspring. They're always attacking the child, and the child grows up with indoctrination because he grew up under the adoption agency of the colonists to learn the colonist education about who he is. You know you're black, right? Yeah, I'm black, black and I'm proud. Yeah, that a boy. Indoctrination. <laughs> Psychosis. Cognitive dissonance. You disconnected yourself from your nationality because of indoctrination because the colonists took your child. That's the red dragon. Systematic programming. Uh-huh. But guess who consented to that? The mother. Why? Because your mother's mother thought she was black too. Because she was the child at one time. Let's continue with the reading because what, what's, let's get back to point. What is the point of this discussion, this, this lesson plan? How did the Moors lose their land? They lost their land through a pen. Naturalization Act of 1870, pages 254 to 256, section 7, descendants of Africans shall be citizens of the United States under a denizen status of alien. That's Revelations chapter 12, verse 1 through 6, if I'm not mistaken. The dragon has devoured your child. And then the child, what does that mean, devour? Digested. You ever have readers digest? So therefore, the child turns into an adult one day, and that adult turns around and teaches the next child that indoctrination. That's how they devour us as a community because we think we're crayons. The mothers taught the child this. And the teacher at school doubled down on it. Your pastor at the church tripled down on it. So when the mothers wake up and realize their child is not a crayon, because you know that you have a nationality, then you start to reverse the indoctrination because you now start telling them the truth. Let's continue with the reading. That was it. That was it. Okay. So that's alien. Now let's go look up the word subject. They use that word a lot on their definition of denison, correct? Subject. And what page is subject for the people at home? Down at the bottom. There it is. Subject, page 594. So, 1594. excuse me, 1594. So we can have the mothers read subject to Black's Law Dictionary, fourth edition. Where's yours? Um, I guess we... oh. No, fourth edition. Um, subject to liable, subordinate, subservient, inferior. Obedient to, governed or affected by, provided that, oh, provided that, provided, answerable for, 
American. See the word American? Yeah. Those who call themselves American. That's case law. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Are subjects. So let's go back over the reading. So anyone is referred to as a subject, which is the second lowest class. You got alien, subject. Remember in Denison, they stuck between an alien and a subject. So a subject is liable, subordinate, um, subservient, inferior, obedient to. Obedient to who? The government. Why? Because you're the stepchild. You got to now stick to the rules of legislation, codes, and statutes, which is in law. Only way for you now to get back your rightful place of rights to enforce treaties, constitutions, conventions, and declarations, you must have a nationality. So a subject is someone that's inferior. And people who call themselves Negro, Black, and Colored, minority, African American, don't realize they're consenting to, through acquiescence, to allow the colonists to take away their birthright because they agreed to it. Why? Because we threw a pen, a black person checks the box, black. Now the new cool name is African American. None of these things are nationality. They're all a status to steal your birthright. Okay, now that we know what an alien is, now we know what a subject is, let's look up the definition of citizen. Even though when you have time, you should read the entire definition of citizen when you have time. So what a mother's read, the definition of citizen. Citizen, a member of a free city or rural uh, society. Civitas, posing all the rights and privileges which can be enjoyed by any person under its constitution and government. Possessing. All the rights. Possessing all the rights and privileges which can be enjoyed by any person under its constitution and government, and subject to the corresponding duties. Citizens, quote unquote citizens, are members of community inspired to, com to common goals, who in associated relations submit themselves to rules of conduct for the promotion of general welfare and conservation of individuals as well as collective rights. Case law. All right. So what do we learn? That someone called them citizens have a right to rights and privileges. They're making a distinction. Rights and the privileges. So rights mean you can enforce treaties and constitution. Privileges means you're subordinate, you're subject and alien. You can't enforce real rights. You get civil rights, and which is not civil rights, it's civil privileges. They just don't tell you that. But by your acquiescence, when you check the box black, by an adhesion contract, you're saying that you're an alien and a subject by your own consent. So therefore, you're automatically classed underneath civil privileges. Whereas those who have a nationality can enforce rights under a treaty, constitution, conventions, and declarations. You must understand these classifications mean something. So what's the highest classification? A national. Let's look up the definition of national, fourth edition. National. Pertaining or relating to a nation as a whole, commonly applied in American law to institutions, laws, or affairs of the United States, or its government, as opposed to those of the several states. The term national, as used in the phrase national of the United States, is broader than the term citizen. Uh huh. Now watch this. You see it's got the quote-unquote around the word national. So let's read that para paragraph again, Mother. So when you see the quote, you say quote-unquote national. Let's read it again. The term national, 
quote-unquote national as used in the phrase national of the United States, quote-unquote, quote-unquote, is broader than the term citizen, quote-unquote. Quote so what are they saying there? They already know in the United States, no one is a national. You got to catch that. When they put in the quote unquote, they're trying to let you know something. Something ain't real here. There's some de facto language going on here. But therefore, let's look at the real strict sense of what they just said. What did they say? Under national. They said the term national, quote unquote, as used in the phrase of national of the United States, quote unquote, is broader than the term citizen, quote unquote. So national is the highest, citizen is the second, subject is the third, alien is last. So the Naturalization Act of 1870, page 254 to 256, section 7, it says the African descendants shall be aliens. They put you at the bottom through an act of Congress with a pen. So let's talk about the solution. Now that we pointed out one of the problems, that's one of the major problems, what you call a radical, radical act by a de facto government. What is the solution? The solution is mothers. Mothers must be cognizant because you're giving birth to the child. A new generation of children that come into the world have to understand they're not adjective, they're not Negro, black, and colored. They're not minorities. They're not African Americans. Because Africa America is two continents. That's not a country. That's not a nationality. So what's the solution? You must do what's called a reversion. You must do what's called an adverse claim. You must do what's called a restoration. You must do what you call reparation. Reparation means to repair to the original status. It don't have nothing to do with a check. Watch this. But how do you do it? You got to do it the same way they did it. What a pen. Okay, what do you do with the pen? You must proclaim your nationality. That's number one. With a pen. Then you must put together a government. A government of elected body officials. And then you must have a constitution. Then you must have consular court, a loyal land claim to the land, the latitude, longitude of the land. Then you must have a national trust, a flag, and a seal. Watch this. What does the constitution mean for every country around the world? It means this is a birth record. It's the birth of a nation. It's a political document. Because the mother carries the days your bloodline anyway. But now she must create what's called a political document. Because around the world, they accept your papers, your patent letters. What is the, what is the Constitution? It is a birth record. Let's go deeper. The woman carries the two X chromosomes together in the womb. Out of her egg are two X chromosomes. So therefore, Mother Earth is a living being. And the woman, women walking around Earth is their human being. When y'all come together, together, that's the two X chromosome. So therefore, from a political perspective, you must have a birth record. What's the birth record mean? The Constitution that says you're creating a nation on paper. That's the political document that all states, countries, tribes, and clans must have. You must create a state. First, it starts with your state of mind. Then you create a political state on paper. Constitution through your elected officials. Not just self-appointed people. Elected officials have ballots, election, and inauguration. Have your flag, your seal, your lodial land claim, which is another political document. And then your national trust, which is another political document. 
for the people, by the people. Only mothers can do that. And last but not least, birth record for each one of your nationals, i.e., they call birth certificate. All mothers now that proclaim their nationality underneath their state of that constitution now ratifies a birth record for each one of their nationals. What does that mean? The mothers proclaiming and claiming their own child back from that adopted parent, i.e. the state of Colorado, all caps, corporation. Everything the Moorish women do brings us all back to the proper status of saving humanity. Because humanity has fallen. Fallen where? Into the hands of the colonists through a pen. And only mothers can get it back. Now watch this. I'm going to give you a reference point. The rights of indigenous people that was fully ratified by the United Nations has already given us specific instructions on what to do as indigenous people. So for the record, that's the first thing we're going to do is read in the annex, what did the United Nations say about the colonists? So in the annex, let's go ahead and read that, mothers. Rights of indigenous people annex, I think it's uh, article three. I think it's the third article. Rights of indigenous people that was ratified in the year 2007, signed into law by President H. Barack H. Obama in 2010. Is this the one that starts affirming? Yes. Affirming further that all doctrines, policies, and practices based on or advocating superiority of peoples or individuals on the basis of national origin or racial, religious, ethnic, or cultural differences are racist, scientifically false, legally invalid, morally condemnable, and socially unjust. Reaffirming that indigenous peoples in the exercise of their rights should be free from discrimination of any kind, concerned with indigenous peoples, concerned that indigenous peoples have suffered from historic injustices as a result of inter alia, their colonization and dispossession of their lands, territories, and resources, thus providing them from exercising, preventing them from exercising in particular their right to develop in accordance with their own needs and interests. Recognizing the urgent need to respect and promote the inherent rights of indigenous peoples, which derive from their political, economic, and social structures, and from their cultures, spiritual traditions, histories, and philosophies, especially their rights to their lands, territories, and resources. Recognizing also- Okay, let's stop right there. Now watch this. That's in the annex. What's the annex mean? That's the preamble. They're setting you up for what the rest of the articles are going to tell you about. So right there in the annex, the United Nations has already said the colonists are doing everything under what they call doctrines. What's the doctrines? Doctrine discovery, which is legalities such as the Naturalization Act of 1870. They say it's legally invalid. Scientifically false, morally corrupt, etc., etc., etc. They're already calling the colonists alleged criminals. Mm -hmm. Then they go on to start, start saying the indigenous people must create what? Self determination. That's your nationality. Then they start talking about politics. Watch this. Let's now read Article 3 and Article 4 of the rights of indigenous people, fully ratified by the United Nations. Article 3, indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. Article 4. Stop. So Article 3, let's examine what's happening. The United Nations said they gave you specific instructions. Listen, especially Moors at home. The United Nations have given us instructions and Moors are trying to take shortcuts and not listen to the instructions on how to get your land back. It said, first things first, self-determination. What's that? Proclaim your nationality. What's the second thing it says? Politics. What is politics? Government. 
under government, then you can enforce your economics, culture, etc. But what they're not telling you is under politics, you must have a constitution. So now they're going to double down to make sure you understood Article 3. Article 4 is going to disclose exactly what they're trying to say in Article 3. Let's read Article 4, Mother. Indigenous peoples, in exercising their right to self-determination, have the right to autonomy or self-government in matters relating to their internal and local affairs, as well as ways and means for financing their autonomous functions. So stop right there. What do we have here? Now they're being clear. First you claim, proclaim your nationality. I'm a Moor. More specifically, Moroccan. That's the nationality, Moroccan. A Moor. Second thing you must do is fully ratify a government. In order to have a government, you must have elections. You can't be self-appointed. Then you must have a constitution, because that constitution now outlines your bylaws as well as your latitude, longitude of your geographical land mass. For us at Elodia Morris Pradium, Monte Colorado, acronym AMPAC, we have a constitution proclaiming our latitude longitude of the geographical area that is 104,485 square feet. 104,185 square feet of land, air, and water. That's an acronym for law. Law is land, air, and water. That's what we claim through our allodial land claim. But how can we do that? First, we have to have a constitution and a government. The government is called the state. So we have a state provincial government here at Elodium Morris Pradium, Auntie Colorado, also known as AMPAC. What else do we have? We have a flag and a seal. What else do we have? We have consular court, and we also have birth records. Because the mother is proclaiming and adverse claiming her own nationals. Because nationals have the highest status. Only a mother can do that through a pen. They stole it from you with a pen. All you got to do is take it back with a pen. That's simple. That's simple. Watch this. Let's give you another reference point. Let's look up now the Vienna Convention of 1969. I don't think y'all have a copy, but I have it here in my hands. The Vienna Convention of 1969, in which I make reference to quite often, it tells you right in the annex in the first two articles of the obligations of Moors on how you get your land back. Keep in mind that it was fully ratified in 1969, 42 years ago, that the Moors haven't been following instructions. Let's read the instructions. The Convention, 1969. Here we go. Believing that the codification and progress development of the law of the treaties achieved in the present convention will promote the purpose of the United Nations set forth in the Charter, namely maintenance of international peace and security, the development of friendly relations, and the achievement of cooperation among nations. So this is to bring people together, right? Listen. Affirming that the rules of customary international law will continue to govern questions not regulated by the pre provisions of this present convention. So what it says, it says affirming that the rules, there's the rules of engagement. Morris haven't been following the rules. What are the rules? Let's read the rules. Introduction, part one, article one. Scope of the present convention, the present convention applies to treaties between states. So the first rule is, you must have a state. I'll read it again. Scope of the present convention, the present convention applies to treaties between states. Moors been out here rule. Moors don't have a state through their constitution, through their matriarchal council, which is the women who sign off on that constitution and birth records. 
The flag represents the woman. The seal represents the woman. Everything comes through the woman. Because you got to understand, the colors through a pen stole everything from a woman. So only a woman can get it back. So therefore, the stink is a political word for saying the political document, which is the Constitution, which is the birth record, the birth of a nation. And only a mother can draft that, sign off on it, to bring her sons and daughters back into a national status, which is the highest status. Let's continue with the instructions. Watch this. Article 2. Use of terms. Number 1. For the purpose of the present convention. Listen. Article 1, Section 8. Treaty, quote unquote, means an international agreement concluded between states in the written form and governed by the international law, whether embodied in a single instrument or in two or more related instruments, wherever its particular designation. So what's the instrument? The Constitution from a mother creating a state, a provincial state within the Moroccan Empire. Birth records, etc. Those are the instruments. Number section one, section B. Watch this. It's called ratification, quote unquote. We'll make sure you get a copy of this. Watch this. Acceptance, approval, and uh, accession means each case, the international act so named whereby a state establishes on the international planes its consent to be bound by a treaty. Only a state can be bound by a treaty. Only a state can ratify a treaty or adopt a treaty or come under the protections of a treaty. A state. And a state has its nationals in it. Moors have not created a political state, a provincial state. Here's the instructions. They're going to keep using the word state. However, Elodium Morris Prairie in Monte Colorado is a provincial state, on the record, for the record. Now that we've done that, let's find out what type of powers we have. Section C. Full powers, quote-unquote, means a document emanating from the competent authority of a state designating a person or persons to represent the state for negotiating, adopting, or authenticating the text of a treaty for expressing the consent of the state to be bound by a treaty or for accomplishing any other act with respect to a treaty. What are they saying? In order to have full powers, you must now have a state, state constitution, flag, seal, Consular court, birth records, a loyal land claim, national trust. Now you can enforce treaties. If you don't have a state, you cannot and have full powers. Moors are run around here rogue. They only have limited powers. Because they ain't been following the instructions of the United Nations, Vienna Convention of 1969. Moors want full powers, but they're taking shortcuts. They're not following the instructions. The mothers have to bring our active Moors back into the fold of government with a state, a provincial state. Provincial means a small portion of an entire empire. So you must have a provincial state that the mothers have to bring back to life. Only mothers give life. Sons can't be out here creating life. Sons don't create life. We protect life. That's our job. But your son's out here taking life. With what? A pen. And guns. Let's continue the reading. After full powers. Reservations. How do you reserve your rights? You know how people put on there, all rights reserved? Let's figure out, how do you reserve your rights? Good question. Let's read the law, the material fact. Reservation, which is section D, says means a, a unilateral statement, however phrased or named, made by a state. What does that mean? Under your own consciousness, you can create a state with your population through your ratified government through elections. 
when signing, ratifying, accepting, approving, or ascending to a treaty whereby it purports to exclude or to modify the legal effect of certain provisions of the treaty to their application to that state. So what's happening here? In order to reserve all rights reserved, you have to reserve those treaties that are already set forth, that are well set of principles, and adopt them underneath your state provincial government that has a constitution flag and a seal, etc. Birth records by the mothers. Only the mothers can do this with a pen. Let's continue with the reading. Moors want to negotiate. They want to talk to the United States of America. They want to talk to the several states. Let's negotiate. I need you to remove habeas corpus and you sit in abundance of jurisdiction, court warrant. You're trying to negotiate with a colonist. Well, how can you negotiate? What gives you the authority? Let's read it. What does the United Nations say? The instructions. How do you negotiate? Okay. Negotiating state, quote unquote, is what they say right off the top. You got to be a state in order to negotiate. Are you listening? Yes. This word state is important to understand. They give me the answers to the test. Moore has been failing the test. Let's continue to reading. Section E, negotiating state means a state which took part in the drawing up and adoption of the text of the treaty. That means either you can create a treaty or you can adopt a treaty. But you must be a state. Moors can't enforce treaties if they don't have a state. A consulate can't enforce a treaty because a consulate must be affiliated to a government. And that government must be ratified through elections and have its consular court, birth records, seal, flag, constitution, etc., by the mothers. That's the only way to negotiate as a state. So you want a contract? Because that's what all agreements are, contracts. So now you're trying to contract with the United States of America Corporation or the several states of they're all corporations, so they get in contract with you. So you're talking contract when you're trying to get out of a speeding ticket, because that was a contract. They're claiming your speed, that speeding ticket is a contract. So how do you get out of that contract, i.e. that suit the speeding ticket? Watch this. Contracting state. Section F. So if you want to talk contracts, you must have a state. Contracting state means a state which consisted to be bound by the treaty, whether or not the treaty has entered into enforce. You want to enforce treaties? You want to negotiate? You want to talk contracts? You must have a state. Moors haven't been established in states, which makes us outlaws. We're working outside of the law contract. Anytime you're working outside of the law contract, outside of the law makes you an outlaw. That's why the United States of America ain't listening to us, although they're criminals. That's why the several states don't listen to Moors, although they're criminals. It's because we are violating the law ourselves. We haven't been following the instructions. My job is just to simply read the instructions. That's what judges do. They interpret the law. I'm reading the law to you right now. Law of what? International law of mothers. Only mothers can create international law because you created life on earth. So let me say this, although I've just given you a reference point. How is it Moors can have the right to use their pen? What gives us, us our delegation of authority to pick up a pen and write ourselves back in the law? Go ahead, Mother, if you think you have the answer. That's correct. Your consanguinity is the number one thing. First, you must proclaim your nationality. Then you can set up government. Now watch this. What does the United Nations say about you proclaiming your nationality? Let's stick to the reference point. Let's talk law. Now you must go to the Treaty of Madrid of the year 1880, Article 15. 
And for the purpose of the class, I'm going to have the mothers read Article 15 of the Treaty of Madrid, 1880, which is called the Protections of Moroccans. So I'm going to hand this to the mothers. Matter of fact, Mother Nicole. Okay. Now keep in mind now, these are reference points. This is well set of principles of law. So if the mother can read Article 15, that would be great. Any subject of Morocco has been naturalized in a foreign country who shall return to Morocco shall have shall after having remained for a length of time equal to to that what shall have been regularly necessary for him to obtain such naturalization choose between entire submission to the laws of the empire and the obligation to quit Morocco unless it shall be proved that his naturalization in a foreign country was obtained with the consent of the government of Morocco. Foreign natural, naturalization heretofore acquired by subjects of Morocco according to the rules established by the laws of each country shall be continued to them as regards all its effects without any restriction. Stop. Excellent. So, Mother, if you don't mind, I'll take that from you now so I can go ahead and use the interpretation so that the mothers, the Moorish mothers, can now get their sons to understand their obligations. So we're going to read Article 15 of the Treaty of Madrid, 1880. Article 15 reads as follows. Any subject of Morocco, so remember, what is a subject? person that's now in an inferior position. Someone stole their birthright and made them a servant. An alien. an alien. So any subject of Morocco who has been naturalized, Naturalization Act 1870, the descendants of Africans are now aliens and subjects. In a foreign country, what foreign country? The United States of America is a foreign private corporation calling itself a country. And who shall return to Morocco. When you return to Morocco, it's y'all call your consciousness. Because you're already standing on Morocco. Now you become cognizant. You no longer suffer from cognitive dissonance. Now you come into the de jure understanding that you're Moroccan. You come back into Morocco because you're standing on Morocco. Actually, you didn't come back to nothing. You just realized you're already standing on it. Isn't that what they told Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz? You're already home. You just bumped your head. You bumped your head, Dorothy. And now you're awakening to understand you're already in Morocco. Now watch this. So after having remained for a length of time equal to that which shall have been regularly necessary for him to obtain such naturalization, so the Moors were naturalized by the colonists, since 1870, now we're in the year, we're in the 21st century. So for a period of time, we've been naturalized. So as he's saying here, now you've been naturalized for a period of time, watch this. You can choose between the entire submission to the laws of the empire and the obligations to quit Morocco, unless it shall be proved that his naturalization in a foreign country was obtained with the consent of the government of Morocco. What does that mean? See, the United States of America never got the consent from the Moroccan government to allow Moors to be citizens of the United States. So as soon as a Moor realizes he's a Moor, he's no longer a Negro, black, and colored, African American, and minority, he says, no, I'm a Moor. You immediately come under the protections of the Moroccan government. However, if you want to remain Negro, black, and colored, i.e. a citizen of the United States, you got to get permission consent from the Moroccan government to remain as a subject of a foreign country. Let's continue to read. Foreign naturalization heretofore acquired by subjects of Morocco 
according to the rules established by the laws of each country shall be continued to them as regards all its effects without any restrictions. So therefore, more, when you come out in the continent of being Moroccans, you will have no restrictions by the United States of America. The United Nations will protect your rights, and your mother will protect your rights, because through a pen, she created a state government, constitution, a flag, a seal, a loyal land claim, a national trust, birth records, etc., 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 because she's following the instructions of the Vienna Convention of 1969. So I'm going to end on that note. Moors must follow the law. Thank you. Once again, this is another short definition under Article 64. If they knew.